Dom, <laughs> kick us off. Episode number two of the Mayhem Performance Podcast. Quarterfinals 2024 has come to a close. Hold on. Who are we sponsored by for, for this Froning episode? Farms. Froning Farms. Uh, Mayhem Athlete. Buffalo Brew. And... Any other companies owned and operated by Rich Froning? Yes. Great. Yes. Yeah. Covered it all. Yeah. Good, good Perfect. All. And Prey t-shirts. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our mom dressed us today. Yeah. Thank you, Dre, for the great design. Yeah, thanks, Dre. Um, but yeah, quarterfinals 2024 uh, come to a close. We're going to try to recap that for you guys. Uh, just kind of walk through the workouts and just thinking about season, whether you made it to semifinals or you're going into off-season training, kind of what that looks like for you. And then... Um, just kind of as as coaches, how we approach an off season, and just uh, how we approach a year coaching our athletes, and what that looks like from the foundational aspect of, you know, what we like to build with our athletes as people, and then also like setting out goals for a season and what that what that can look like, um, no matter what happened for you in your quarterfinals. Um, so I think just starting with the workouts and looking yeah. through that. So you talk about who he is. Oh yeah. Duh. Jake, who are you? Give us a brief that. synopsis, and then we'll jump into quarterfinals chat. Uh, yeah. Look, coaching oh. background. Okay. Yeah, coaching background first. Just some bullet, bullet points. Um, okay. I've been in CrossFit coaching for the past, like, 15 years, I think. I think I went and got my L1 when I was, like, 19. Um, and funny story, I went and got it and had no idea that I was going to get a job. But I emailed the owner of the CrossFit gym at the time and was just like, hey, if you ever go out of town, like, let me know. I'll be happy to fill in. And he was like, you want a job starting, like, tomorrow? And I was like, and then he told me, he was like, I'll pay you 20 an hour. And I was 19 years old and I was like, let's go. So like this is CrossFit awesome. education. Plan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've been coaching for about 15 years in CrossFit. And then uh, let me see. I met Mike McElroy, who was another one of our performance coaches about 12 years ago at um, yeah a certification course out in Arizona. Um, and so that's kind of how I got linked up in Mayhem. Tell um, us a story. It's a cool story real yeah. quick about the CrossFit games and how... Yeah, just jump yeah. in. How, how you ended up here to begin with. Yeah, um, that was, a, man, that was, that's wild. Uh, I'm even thinking about it now. Um, I I guess it was last year's CrossFit Games. It was probably about a day or two before. I'd been on the fence about if I was going to go or not. Um, I own a gym in Birmingham, CrossFit Laminin, and at the time, you know, CrossFit has made some changes and things like that, and I heard that Don Fall was going to be presenting there at the Games for any of the affiliate owners in the affiliate lounge. So I'm just kind of going back and forth and I just felt this urge, like you need to go. Um, and I didn't really know why, like I knew that that could have been one reason why to go up there and hear that. And so just talked it over with my wife and she was like, go. So, um, I got in the car and drove up by myself just for the week. I didn't know anyone else that was going to be there. Um, and I just remember like just being kind of urged to stop like the first day that I got there. And I just prayed like, Lord, if there's anyone here that I'm supposed to meet or supposed to run into, like, I just pray that you would just lead me to them and just whatever that looks like, I just want to give it to you. And lo and behold, like, I think it was that day or maybe the day after I ran into Mike and I had not met, I had not seen Mike and I mean, it had been a decade, been a long time. And we, he's not on social media. I make like one post on social media a year. Like we don't keep up with each other. Uh, and so I just ran into him and he told me, he was like, yeah, I've started doing this performance coaching through Mayhem. Um, and I just told him, I said, Hey man, if y'all are in the future, like ever looking for someone, like just do me a favor and keep me in mind. Like just keep my name in mind and mention it to whoever you need to. And, um, then, yeah. And that was literally the only person there that I met that week. That was like someone that I had known. And, uh, then I guess you reached out to me. What probably, I don't know. It was a couple months after that. Yeah. Something like that. I can't remember. Um, and yeah. And you were like, Hey, yeah, I'd like to talk to you. And, uh, yeah. So me and you went back and forth in the interview process and wound up here. So, um, yeah, it was a very, we had, we had two coaches come from the CrossFit games. Yeah. yeah right. Cause you came Jake from there too. Dom. We're yeah. changing uh, mayhem performance coaching to mayhem Providence coaching. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah basically. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so anyways, I've been on the team, uh, for about six months now. Yeah. But I've been coaching individual athletes, right. For well over, I mean, I don't know. It's been yeah, about 10 Fun years. Fun fact too, you, you competed at the same against rich technically, right. In did. 2010 sanctionals, uh, or Oh nine. No, it was 10. It was 10. Uh, it was smoked in, him. I did right? not. Yeah. He put everyone on notice that weekend for you uh, created the next chip like on his shoulder years. to become the athlete he is today. No. Uh, Mike competed in that workout. And if you've ever seen Mike, he looks like he's like 
10 years ago, he looked like he was 50, like he does now, <laughs> right? And everyone was like, who's this, who, like, who this awesome. old man out here? Uh, and he was just crushing us. But then you saw Rich. Like, there was a workout, the final one. I think it was like handstand push-ups. And you had to do them against the side of a wall. And like the ground was like sloped. We were outside. Like nothing was planned. You're doing snatches and the bars like digging into the ground. Um, and it was, I think it was full squat snatches, which no one even knew how to do that at the time. Like you just power snatch it up and then you do an overhead squat <laughs> and rich just crushed everyone. And I mean, just looking around, people were like, Oh wow. Close okay. Not <laughs> yeah. Squat yeah. Snatching yeah. Like it, was, uh, it was crazy. <laughs> we've we've yeah. got some tenure on the staff. We've got, I mean, you started in 09, mm -hmm. Mike, Mike, uh, by the way, is our one of our senior coaches for performance coaching. He started in 07. Yeah, he I might have been even earlier than that. Sean, right. our other senior coach, was 07. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we got some OGs yeah. on, the, on the roster. Austin might have been doing it. Yeah. Stack was yeah. doing it a long time. Austin In did my In level one. <laughs> right. <laughs> Inga basically taught, like, you know, Annie Thor's daughter everything she knows. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Inga goes, well, Domina are actually kind of the relative rookies yeah. on the staff. When yeah. Think about it. But you're so, old in wisdom, so yeah, we're good. Thank you, man. Good. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, segue to quarterfinals. Uh, Dom, you want to give us some ge general takeaways from the weekend? Yeah, uh, a lot of changes this year. Four workouts, 40 qualifying spots um, for each region. Um, but I think we just look at them workout by workout. So workout number one, uh, fight gone bad style, four rounds, minute of snatches, minute of rowing, minute of dumbbell box step-ups. Um, minute of rest for some reason Jake and I were like on the box step up game <laughs> I was doing step overs but I don't know why they were yeah. just like felt like they were coming yeah um, but definitely a new format which I think they talked about like prior to that coming up that we would see like they haven't done AMRAPs like that um, before but what were your guys like thoughts on that workout that's probably the first workout they've done where it's been max reps with minute and different movements right yeah. I mean I think that that's the yeah, first one that you've seen sure. and I'm always cautious about that and from a scoring perspective this one I thought worked out really well because you couldn't really take any time off I know some people game the snatches a little bit to give themselves some time to get on the rower and get on the step ups because they felt like they can make some time up there but you still you couldn't dog it on the power snatches right but if you use different movements like if that workout had had a minute double unders right that completely changes the way you approach that because you can get so many more reps on it um, so I thought that the movement selection for that one in terms of score or reps per minute was actually really good. Like I thought that was a it was a good test. That's relatively equivalent. Yeah, right. I mean, unless you're like an insane rower, right? Which there was a lot of that, especially on the guy's side. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like yeah. max reps you could get in a minute, right? Sure. The row is probably the highest, but step ups everyone's going to be around you know higher level athletes around twenty one somewhere around there, and then snatches anywhere from you know I know some people got we're getting fifteen ish, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like that workout. What do you think? I mean, I would even zoom out and say overall, I think for four workouts uh, for the top 25%, I don't know how you could, I mean, there are some ways maybe that it could be programmed better, mm -hmm. but I would give it an A, right? Yeah. Like, I, I, I mean, I think it was a well-rounded test. I think you put, again, you, you have to consider we have the top 25% now, so you put the heavier barbell at the end of the workout. You put the higher skill gymnastics at the end of the workout, very was it 14 one esque 23.1 esque on the yeah. gymnastics piece like i think overall a great set and well-rounded tests and yeah. um i think yeah any workout you look you got to look in the bigger mm -hmm. like broader puzzle um so yeah i mean that's a big man's workout like you said if you can crank it on the rower if those power snatches are light for you the step ups at 20 inches for guys who are five foot 11 and taller is going to be a lot easier but again, you know, that's zooming in on one workout. If you start making the criticism like a big man workout, well, it's like, we got to zoom out. Let's look at the rest of the workouts yeah. and tests. So sure. um, I think holistically, all of them were done pretty well. Yeah, it's pretty, so, pretty well thought out for sure. Yeah, I think on the qualifying end of things, I do think with limiting, well, at least for us in the U.S., I think pulling our uh, regions down to 40 spots yeah. instead of 60 and giving those to other um giving it to Asia and to South America, those extra spots for, to get them to 40, um, I think makes it tougher when there's only four scores. Like yeah. I felt like when I looked at the whole thing, I, I wasn't really upset with the programming at all. I actually thought it was really well done. But I think they made a mistake for the sport in terms of having enough scores to display the fullness of fitness. Like I think they were missing out on one score and should have kept five. 
And the main reason I think that is because of how many days we had to do it. Mm -hmm. And there was too many high level people repeating three or four times yep. on workouts. And we're normally with the fifth score, it forces you to submit a couple first times, which makes it more like realistic to like game day competition, which I tend to like in our sport. Like when you get one shot, one strategy, mm -hmm. maybe you get one or two repeats. But I mean, I have heard and even had some of my own guys upwards of repeating these workouts that are semifinal games level athletes three times, four times. We've never touched that in a quarterfinal. And I think that's just like either like a little scheduling mistake of going Wednesday to Monday or just missing out on a fifth workout or a fifth score. What do you think about Casho's idea with the uh, open being the fifth score? I don't I, know where you said that. He, right? he didn't say that specifically. Or, he talked about how like um, the open will matter next year. Okay. And they're oh, going to so find people are inferring that they're going to find a way to like yeah. make it. So each that doesn't fix your problem though. The redos, you right. just have to shorten the window. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the uh, obviously too we've talked we've all talked about this a lot uh, when we're talking about like big picture recap of quarters the top twenty five percent obviously makes a big difference too it's going to push some people's scores who are maybe like top two hundred top one fifty you're going to get some I don't know how to say it but like more politically correct than average Joes mm -hmm. who can walk in and just I mean they're just elite upper muscle endurance or not even elite like they're solid and they can put up some solid scores and they start bumping other people's scores down where you get some really strong dudes who've got some good yeah. strength endurance yep. who can move that 245 barbell like a toy and all of a sudden like other scores are being knocked down opening the field up definitely had a big impact not in the top 10 right but right like from between 20 to 40 yeah or maybe even you know 40 to 62 as sure. well yep. so and then the other element of it I think is that with only four scores, it's always been the case that you could never have like a bad workout. Yeah. But when there's four scores, if you have a workout that is even like moderately poor for you, right, it is going to play out big. I mean, that's 25% of your score with four workouts. And like before it was 20%, which is still a little bit less, but it just makes the well-roundedness that much more important, right, with only four scores. Which I think sure. legitimizes the sport. Mm -hmm. You know, like the the – more empathetic side of me wants to be like, well, we need more opportunity. It's like, but this is sport, right? It's like, and it, I mean, it's the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. It's like you, you've got, I mean, and like you say, oh, you always say, Dom, like their argument's always going to be, well, the cream always rises to the top. Like the top 10 are always the top 10, but it's actually a legitimate argument. Mm -hmm. It's like those, the best are always making it and the best are coming out on top because they're the most well-rounded. And I mean, it just reinforces what the cliche we already know. It's like, if you want to win in CrossFit, you have to be as rich would always, you got to be good at CrossFit. You got to be well-rounded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm, I'm big on that as a coach too. Like even for myself, when I was competing at a very low level, <laughs> um, like my coach always used to tell me this and it was Matt. He always used to tell me, he's like, Hey man, it's great that you can do handstand walking like crazy for 200 feet unbroken, but if you can't do 15 burpees over a box in 40 seconds without having a heart attack, you're never going to make it. Mm. And it was like, it's like at the end of the day, when we look at the quarterfinals and I'll segue us into event two, like if we can't do wall balls and burpee box jump overs, like you have to earn the higher skills and we might have a lot of higher skill athletes that might've just missed out on semifinals. And, you know, I myself have that as well. And it even allows me to reflect as a coach, like, am I living by that philosophy? Like, can we do the most basic CrossFit mm -hmm. amazingly? Because at the end of the day, the Tia Toomey's of the world are still the best at the basic CrossFit. Yep. Yeah. And she's the best burpee box jump over in the world. And like, are we doing that first before we have the 200 pound snatch? Am I doing that first before I'm doing the 20 unbroken ring muscle ups? Or do I have an athlete that can do 20 unbroken ring muscle ups, but can't hold 50 burpee box jump overs in three and a half minutes? If yep. that's the case, I need to be working more on burpee box jump overs. I mean, that's at the, muscle -ups. the CrossFit pyramid, yeah. right? Like metabolic conditioning. Yeah. That's so, the base. Yeah. yeah. And I think this year was Castro pulling back and going like, it was almost a, I feel like a response to last year. Yeah. Like the gimmicky. We've gone too far. Yeah. We've gone too far. Yeah. We got to pull it back. And yeah. you guys think, you know, watch, let's, we're going to do CrossFit. Yeah. I think is what we got to this year. I think the caution is, is we were talking about this, Dom, you and I did, Jake, you and I did. It's like we can't then – it's freaking Dave Castro and it's CrossFit. We can't overcompensate this year. And then it's sure. like everybody gets really good at burpees, and then next year a heavy snatch complex comes out right. and buries everybody. Right. It's we got to be well-rounded, yep. which is the yeah. trickiest part of what we do. It's like yeah. playing chess, right? It's, also, it's the most fun, 
and it's the thing that keeps us up at night. Yeah, and I just I think it's definitely tempting with athletes that are that you know have a potential to be in the semifinal games level area to focus more on the higher skill mm-hmm. stuff that comes up in semis in the games. And sometimes we can just like miss out on remembering the foundations of just like basic wall ball, therapy uh, box jump over in high volume. Yeah. Okay. And that's what I was going to say. Like even from an athlete's perspective, like let's just be honest, it's a lot more fun to come in and work on like the high skill, sexy stuff, right. That doesn't really hurt. Whereas a 20 minute AMRAP of wall balls and burpee box, who, I mean, I don't know. I don't know many people who are like itching just to get after that, right? Like, oh yeah, I get to get better at this today. Like it's the stuff you have to work on though. It's the foundation of the sport. And no matter how progressed you get in skills, you have to keep coming back to that and sharpening that over and over and over again, and even continuing to improve it because it is what's going to set you up. And I think just moving forward, athletes who are on the bubble, right? Like, it capacity matters and like you have to make sure that you're doing everything you can to improve that year after year. And let's, let's be, we might as well be open and honest, like humble a bit, like Dom and I were saying, like leading into quarterfinals, we did not have enough of our athletes like playing the game. Like how many, how many times did we at mayhem, like on site training? How many times did we just go for 20 minutes? How many times did we do a 20 minute AMRAP or 15 minute AMRAP? Definitely not enough. I don't even know if we did it at all. Yeah. And I think like like evaluating that, even myself, looking at all our athletes, even the ones that did well, like we definitely had some athletes that were crushing that workout. But when I look at it comparatively to the field and I look at the training we were putting together, like it's one thing I missed. And I think it's because we're taking more of a semifinal outlook Yeah, and we missed out on that one workout. And it's like, we should have been expecting something basic and something long Mm -hmm. like that. Um, and that's not to say like the only way you get better 15 minute AMRAPs is doing 15 minute AMRAPs. That's sure. oversimplification. We can talk about interval training and the benefits of interval training, but sports specificity is key. It's the simplest principle in strength and conditioning. It's like play the game mm-hmm. before the game, like in the, in the weeks or you know, however long you can debate, but we got away, I think from playing the game a little too much. Yeah. And you know, I think yeah. it's your fault. <laughs> yeah, definitely. yeah. I mean, I was even thinking about something I did last year and, I don't know why I didn't do it this year, but a month leading into quarters last year um, and even semifinals is I was looking at .com every day. Mm-hmm. And if something came out that I was like, hmm, I don't really think like that programming wise, I would plug it in mm-hmm. yeah. for them or like a variation of it. Maybe I would switch the movements and keep the rep scheme or something um, to what my athletes need. And I would throw that in sometimes. And I think that's almost a good thing leading into a competition because yeah. like I don't always think HQ's way of programming. Yeah. Um, well, I think you and I like just a almost in defense for ourselves and some of the other performance coaches, like we're, I mean, I've been here for a year and a half. You haven't even been here for a year yet. We're, we're, we're learning at every, every camp's probably got their system and their way of doing things. And instead of us looking at dot com, we've been metaphorically or in quite literally looking at like, how does mayhem do it? Sure. And how do we mold our previous biases and like strength conditioning philosophy is a big word toward like, and make it look like mayhem. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that may have, I don't know, I'm getting honest here, <laughs> but distracted us a little bit, not in a bad way. It's just like we just stopped looking at the basics, like you said, just, yeah. to, just to keep it simple. And so. I think, to be fair, there are going to be a lot of, we're not going to be the only camp, right, looking at things and just kind of, like, you should be doing it every year. Yeah, we're trying to be very have, introspective right now. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I'm just saying everyone's going to be doing that, yeah. I think, because, I mean, I just, I know some people who compete and, you know, from other camps and programs and stuff, and it's happening everywhere. You're seeing people who were close last year, not even close this year. You're seeing people who were left out and not even close to the bubble last year who got in this year. Like, it's gone back and forth, and I think, like you said, right, you want to evaluate it but you want to take everything and just understand that next year it'll be different again. Right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. there was i uh, I'm going to transition us into event three, but there was something newer this year at this stage that I just started thinking about really yesterday when I was like going through the workouts in my own head. And we've seen a lot of muscle up in this stage under trunk fatigue, mm-hmm. right? Under core fatigue. But what we haven't really yet seen at this stage is muscle ups under grip fatigue mm-hmm. or muscle ups under insane shoulder fatigue. Um, there was a workout at Rogue, right? That was a uh, handstand push up, snatch, yep. and then it started with muscle up. The 10 rounds. The 10 rounds. Yeah. But you would come back to the muscle up, right? And honestly, like with Emma, for example, like thinking about it, because I coach her at Rogue, that was something we were working on a lot because I knew muscle ups for her under shoulder fatigue are extremely hard in the dip. So that's like someone who was prepared. But 
I think a lot of leading into quarters, I spend a lot of time with my athletes working on like chunk fatigue muscle ups because that's what we've seen. So I was trying to follow that trend and then they, they threw in the grip fatigue and I noticed my girls, not really my boys, but my girls really struggling with the muscle ups after the rope climb. Mm-hmm. And especially because they're so good at handstand pushups that it was basically like 10 rope climbs for time into 20 muscle ups for time. And I didn't really know how that was going to affect them. And it even made it hard to strategize, like, what muscle up set do we pick? How slow and how long does it take us to get to the muscle ups so that we can be effective? Um, and honestly, like, all my girls did really well on that workout. But still, in comparison to what I thought they would be capable of, they didn't do as good as I would have liked them to do. And that's something, like, now I've learned a limiter is, like, when's the last time I programmed a rope climb or a pulling movement? into a muscle up and it's been a long time. I've done a lot of pressing into muscle ups. I've done a lot of trunk fatigue into muscle ups, legs into muscle ups, breathing into muscle ups, but have I actually done grip fatigue into muscle ups? And I actually don't even know if I've really touched that. Ask a, ask and that's a mistake on my ask end. Ask Nick Azor about that progression. I did like a whole rope climb muscle up progression, but I'll actually flip it and, and kind of draw out a bigger principle, which is I was thinking about muscle ups under grip fatigue. I was thinking about 23.1 and I was like how badly that, screwed up a lot of my 14, one, 23, one, like the total bar and you got the power clean. And I mean, I did that workout. My grip is blown up. Everybody's saying their grip is blown up and I'm thinking the opposite way, which then just goes right back to the yeah. simple principle that kind of annoys us as coaches, which is like constantly varied. Yeah. Like, Can't um, be good at all. Yeah. yeah. Right. And yeah, we, sometimes we get too locked in on certain, we were talking about the, this morning with the, with the coach, um, the running coach who came on, did the workshop with the coaches is like, the speed, the idea of speed play, like fart lick training and running and how we can apply that to interval training for us in the sport, how we get so locked in on certain interval time domains, certain movement pairings and combinations that we think flow together well. Yeah. And, and then we just, yeah, we get sucked in and zoned in. And and this is, yeah. yeah. There's so many movements. There's so much to it. it, We got to, we got to almost play more. And that (laughs) one thing I will say about workout number three, I think, the best workouts are ones that can have multiple limiters in them, right? Because if you've got a four workout test and you're only testing one limiter in each workout, right? Well, then that leaves a lot of room for someone just to get a fastball, right? And for all those to hit and those weaknesses not to be tested. That workout number three, I can't remember a time when I've gone around and asked my athletes like, hey, what was it that caught you up, right? And got so many different answers. Yeah. Like I got grip fatigue. I got midline fatigue yeah. from the rope, like going toe to bar into the yep. rope. Their hip flexors were just shot. I got breathing and then I got pressing endurance, yep. yeah. right? Like there were so many things. I think it's only grip up. fatigue if you if you have enough muscular endurance in your shoulders to actually go fast enough on sure. the handstand pushups and everything. For most people, I don't think it had anything to do with grip. Like it, it was just more like, shoulders. It was yeah. more shoulder shoulders. tricep. For I sure. had a lot of tricep in the dip. Yeah. Right. Cause I was at a stuff. local affiliate on Sunday and I was, I watched like six people do it. And you know, yeah. afterwards like, how'd your grip feel? They're like grip. Like, yeah, I was just standing at the handstand push up wall right. for like 10 minutes, you right. know? Yeah. So right. cause not everybody can just like slam through the yep. handstand push ups. Yeah. Nobody's yeah. Sure. None of them got through the rope climbs. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I think like, again, there's one thing I love about competing as a coach is, you know, even though I felt like I took a little L on that, it made me restructure. It's like, okay, that's a, that's another thing I got to add to like limiter based training is I got to combine grip fatigue muscle ups. So now we do trunk fatigue muscle ups. We do breathing fatigue muscle ups. We do <laughs> shoulder fatigue muscle ups, but n- I got to add in grip fatigue muscle ups. And for some reason I hadn't really been doing much of that. But how We're do you thinking, do limiter based training on a template? Plug Mayhem Performance Coaching. That's the yeah. beauty of individualized training, yeah. which is like, we're going to look at your limiter, what you need to work on the most, and then we're going to attack it, Absolutely. right? Whereas like, you know, anything else, it's like, you're just shuffling. You got to, what are you going to hit? Muscle ups under core fatigue one day, and then the next week you're going to hit that. I mean, you're going to touch it like once a month. Right. And that's so goes back to exactly what he said is like, I sit down with my athletes and I'll use Nina and Jess as an example. Um, like Jess, it was all grip fatigue. Nina was more like there was some grip fatigue, but it was more the pressing yep. for her out of the dip. So it's like, how do we approach the muscle ups for that? When the rope climb wasn't affecting her, the rope climb was affecting Jess so much. So it's like, how do we utilize the handstand push up speed to take more time for the rope rest longer so you can perform the muscle ups well, but in their training, like, what do I work on? Well, grip fatigue muscle ups for Jess because under shoulder fatigue doesn't even matter. The dip yep. is irrelevant for her. For Nina, it's like more shoulder fatigue, less grip training but those are two completely different programs. 
Yeah. yeah. And the one thing about like, I'll say I have some athletes that came on with me before quarterfinals, but really quickly before quarterfinals. So I only had a chance to work with them for probably maybe three weeks or so. Right. So we do the quarterfinal workouts and like this next week, I was able to hear from them, their limiters that they had in the workout or that they perceived were limiters for them in those workouts for quarterfinals. And well, next week, they're actually going to do some more testing on that limiter specifically, that's right? Good. So that then we can set up progressions for their training moving forward. And that's different for each one of them. Like for some of them, it looks like a lot of strict handstand pushups for time and seeing where their muscular endurance needs to prove. And then for others, it for some of them, it did just come down to capacity, right? Well, okay, well, we're going to isolate that now. Yep. Let's get some numbers on it and then let's run a training phase and improve so yeah it's good event four final event um barbell battery, battery yeah battery um which is something we do all the yeah, time jake explain battery to us really quick what do, what do we mean by by battery we're just trying to recharge recharge the battery no um i mean it's basically i mean that is what it what it kind of gets at the name what you're trying to do is you're trying to repeat a high perceived effort right over and over and over again for an extended period of time so it's not just being able to move a one rep max right no it's getting better actually at moving 90 percent right for more reps in a shorter time domain um, and then being able to just let the battery recharge right with a few breaths right back on the barbell a few breaths right back on the barbell and continue to repeat it um, and that is something i think that we yeah, we train quite a bit because it's a huge element in the sport, right? Um, especially, I mean, really just about any level, you're going to get some of that. I mean, I, the Open didn't have any of it, but it has in years past. Um, quarterfinals for sure did with the, the one test on the clean and jerks. Um, and because you see that with people who have the max, right? But they don't have the prerequisite aerobic conditioning, metabolic conditioning, whatever you want to call it, to be able to repeat 90% for a lot of reps. Sure. And so, yeah. How would you say like you would approach an athlete um, like to get better on a workout like that? Because I think a lot of people look at that, um, at least probably on the lower end quarterfinal too, and they're like, oh, if I just get my one rep max stronger, then I'll get better at that workout. Like how do you approach an athlete who's thinking like that where that might not necessarily be the case and maybe you do get their absolute one rep max up, but then their score is still the same on that workout? I mean, I would say, well, first off, I would say, here's why you're wrong, why your one rep max doesn't need to, it may need to improve. Let me, let me sure. clarify real quick. If you look at a power lifter, right, who has a one RM of, let's say, a thousand pound back squat, okay, but you tell them to do max reps at 900 pounds, they're going to get like two reps, right? Um, because NME, we don't want to get into that necessarily, but that's a factor. So there is, I think, sort of a, we do want to raise the ceiling, which would be the max, okay? But there is a point of diminishing return in that where that's not actually helping us get any better at the sport, right? So the sport needs to include under fatigue, barbell cycling and lifting at higher percentages, right? And that's something that can be trained, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I would add like battery is not an energy system, right? Like it's a made up term to just qu like try to categorize what we're doing there. How quickly can you recharge your strength battery? Yeah. Uh, the way to do it could be raising your ceiling. That could be one way. Like if you're one rep max, clean and jerk is 245 which I had a kid in California, shout out Jacob, uh, who PR'd his one rep max at the 245 barbell, which That's is pretty, pretty cool. cool to see. Yeah. Uh, but if he had his clean and jerk at 265, obviously it's a, it's a different ball game for him. So you could raise the ceiling or two, you increase your aerobic fitness okay. because what recharges your battery is the bigger aerobic base you have, the faster your battery recharges. Right. Uh, so getting, AKA getting fitter, like yeah. cardio respiratory fitness is what's going to help you hit more reps at a higher percentage of your one rep max. Yeah. yeah. And you see that. I mean, I saw that in scores with people who have 100%. lower maxes than others that blew them out of the water in that workout. Right. But their aerobic fitness, right. Overall is much higher. Just so. Haley Adams. Hmm. Yeah. Crushing right. that workout. Yeah. Getting in the thirties. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Right. Wow. Jeez. But it just shows you that again, aerobic fitness is the key. And mm -hmm. honestly, like even Jess, who I coach is a great example. Like, her one rep max jerk is 280. Her one rep max power clean is 245-ish. And in the past, she would str she would struggle a bit on a workout like that. But we did tons of aerobic fitness this year. She got insanely better at a wall ball burpee box jump over workout, which she would have definitely time capped last year. And got 37 clean and jerks, which was like eighth in the world. But the only reason she's getting 37 clean and jerks is because why all of her maxes are exactly the same. She hasn't gotten any stronger this year, but she got aerobically fitter. So she can do more reps. So, And I would give the caveat too, though, like at some time, like uh, Justin Collar, I always say like, 
uh, when I was at the underdogs, like engines win championships, which he's right, right at the top, at the top end engines, which there's no debating that. Uh, but we've always said like, you have to be strong enough to get there to begin 100%. with. So at some point you, if your ceiling isn't high enough, this isn't the gate, what we were talking about in the first podcast, like what do people need to be focusing on in the off season? Most people need to be focusing strength. on strength, right? Yep. Uh, most people's ceiling isn't high enough. Like they get to that, they can't even get to the 245 barbell, yep. right? But it's like once your ceiling's high enough, which yep. we will talk about maybe in the future at some point, uh, and we're compiling some data right now, like what does that ceiling need to be? Then yeah, it's engines the name of the game. Yep. So, so I think just taking all four events as a whole and like quarterfinals as a whole, I think a hard reality for our sport is you get one weekend um, to compete, whatever level that is, could be quarterfinals, could be semifinals, could be the games, um, depending on how you make it. And that either puts you into an off season or it moves you on to the next stage. Um, and you basically get one shot and you train a whole year, make a lot of sacrifices for it, hire a coach, uh, do all sorts of things. So I think what we want to do is just kind of take that debrief of quarterfinals and frame it to like what we do in mayhem performance coaching for our athletes and, and what we want to have that based on foundationally um, so that we can execute a life plan that helps you guys become better athletes, better people, better husbands, better wives, better friends, better affiliate owners, um, better competitors. Um, and I think that's foundational to everything because we have to have our identity rooted in the right things. If we're going to be able to handle the brutal side of our sport, which is like we might chip away at something all year long, get 5% better and that might still not be enough to move us to the next stage, even if we worked on our weaknesses all year long. And so I think at the, at the core end of this is like us as coaches and us as a program and even just mayhem as a whole, we want to create an identity that is founded um, in something really strong and rooted something really strong that actually carries us through those years where we might fall a, short, a little short of our goal, um, our temporary goal, and be able to rely on that to carry us to continue to progress. Um, so we kind of want to dive a little bit into that. And I'll let the Jakes open us up um, on what that's really going to look like for Mayhem Performance Coaching. Um, and so that we can all kind of be on the same page of what it really looks like to be a Mayhem Performance Athlete. Because it's not just about qualifying to your end goal. It's not just about making the games or making a semifinal or winning a local competition. Um, there is much more to it than just that. Yeah, the, the, on the cusp of the competition season is what really started these conversations for us as coaches as a whole. So I think we have seven total coaches now. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was having devotions, and it just hit me that it's like as a coaching staff, like Mayhem Athlete has a vision and a mission and a purpose, but as a coaching staff, I want us to have one as well. Like Because we're, it's a little different from Mayhem Athlete. Like Mayhem Athlete is not just for the CrossFit competitor. Main performance coaching is for people who want to compete in the sport of CrossFit. And I really wanted to have uh, a shared, uh, again, vision, for lack of a better term, of, or purpose behind, like, why we do what we do. And um, and to, to go back to Dom said, like, when we say, hey, we coach the whole person, what do we mean by that? And then why do we think that that's really important for people? So we hopped on a coach's call, one of our weekly meetings we do on Wednesdays a couple of weeks ago, and we started talking about that and uh, Jake had some good questions to to get us thinking about it, some discussion questions, and we're still kind of scratching, maybe just scratching the surface, but uh, we don't have like this really pretty like one liner that's like this is who we are and this is who we're for. But we wanted to talk a little bit about that because, like Dom said, after quarterfinals is over, we're seeing emotions all over the place, understandably, yeah. but we're seeing a lot of people who wrap too much of their identity in the sport, and now, like C.S. Lewis said, never let your happiness rest in something you may lose. Mm -hmm. Now their joy is gone. And, and they've been sucked dry. So, yeah, yeah. I, I really want, like, again, we're still thinking through some of these things, but when we say, hey, Mayhem Performance Coaching, we coach the whole person, like, what do we mean by that? And uh, and how does that align with our, our worldview? And yeah. I guess what do we mean by that? Jake, take over. No, I was just going to say, I think that, like, <clears throat> no matter who you're getting coaching from, right, whether they have a clearly defined like ideology of coaching or not, they have one. Okay. And it's going to play out in the way that they coach you or the way that they do what they do, whether that's coaching or anything, right? Like you have presuppositions that you're bringing to the table. Um, and I just, I mean, I see a lot of, um, 
people in the space, right, who coach people, and they say the same things that we're about to say, which is primarily that, you know, hey, if this is just about a leaderboard, right, well, then, you know, we need to change the focus off of that because you don't have any control over that. And like Don was saying, you may have a year that's just a bad year, right, and you need to find your why. Like, that's kind of how they'll they'll phrase it, right? And I just kind of always hear some of that stuff, and I'm just like, okay, well, what are you telling them their why should be? Like, do you have an answer for that? Um, and I mean, I think our, you know, convictions do have an answer for it. Um, I've just heard you were so right. Like sport is just, it's cruel y'all. It is so cruel this past week. Like I was waiting for the leaderboard to come out and like, I don't even have that many athletes that were like on the bubble, but I know the ones that you guys do. Right. And I've sat and talked with them and I know how much work and effort they put into the year. And I'm like nervous as I'll get out for them, you know? And then I see it and it's just like, highest of highs. And then you've got the other person that's just the lowest of lows. Right. Um, and me naturally with my failures as an athlete throughout my entire life, uh, I go to the people with the lows, um, cause I just resonate with that more, you know, just the heartache and the, the failure. Um, but all that to say that like sport is a great thing and competition is a great, good thing. It is a terrible God. Um, it just is. And like, if all of your hope is wrapped up in that, right, you will be crushed. And like, you will be looking I mean, you will not know how to handle it. You won't because you've wrapped everything that you are up into a point on the leaderboard, right? And when that point is not good enough, you are not good enough, right? And when that happens, it just crushes people. And I mean, we all know this. There are people who walk around their entire lives like they have a chip on their shoulder trying to prove something to people, right? Um, And we just, when we say we want to coach the whole person, okay, plain and simple, we have people who do mayhem performance coaching who are don't believe the same things that we believe, right? But what we want to do is we want to be, be able to get them to at least to a place where they can compete freely, right? Where they can go out and feel like they have nothing to lose, right? So that that way they can reach their fullest potential in the sport. Now for us, that identity is rooted in Christ, right? Like that verdict has already been given, okay? So we can go and we can have everything to fight for and nothing to lose at the same time. And I'm telling you right now, you don't want to face that competitor on the competition floor. You don't because they're dangerous, right? And that's what we want to try to do with our approach to coaching our athletes. And I think as coaches, it's something, and I, I've been talking with this with my athletes, like I have a couple of girls that are on the chance of getting a backfill. One's really close, one's a little further away. And it's just like, even for me, as a coach, like there's a part of that that sucks, but at the end of the day, I have a really cool opportunity to show them like what it looks like to actually have my identity and the right thing. And something I've always preached to them is like, we will win and lose together no matter what. Mm. And like, as like you feel it, I'm going to feel it with you. And we're going to like walk through that, but there's no position on a leaderboard that will ever change the way I treat them a, as an athlete, but more importantly, more importantly, be as my friend. Mm. Um, and I think I have to live that out first as a coach if I'm going to expect my athletes to do it yeah. um, and even be able to help them not only be rooted in the leaderboard. Um, so I actually, like what you just said, I have to believe as well. Mm. Like, is my athletes' performances and achievements as an athlete my identity? Right. And is am I worried about, like, my reputation being on the line with those athletes based on their leaderboard score? Or am I worried about how people view me based on how, how my athletes view me and what I do for them in their lives as a whole, mm-hmm. not just as an athlete. And I need to do both well, for sure. And I think like one thing I wanted them to gain from this of us being like right on the cusp there is that for them to see that it hurts me just as much as it hurts them. Cause I'm also competitive and I'm like, I was like mad for a second that we've like missed it by two points mm-hmm. or something. Right. And a couple execution errors and that as much as that, honestly, like, for Nina, we were talking about it and she was like, you're more upset than I am right now. And I was like, well, good. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. that means I've done my job with you, helping you find identity and good things. But at the same time, I also want you to still be fired up because we want to go be out and compete at semifinals. This is why this can be maybe controversial. Who cares? This is the beauty of being at mayhem. We get to lean into this. Is that like, this is why Christian coaches are the best coaches mm-hmm. in the same way that Christian athletes can be the best athletes. When I was in college, I read a book called the vocation of a Christian scholar without getting too heady, it was basically about like why Christians can be some of the best scholars in the world because we live in a faith built on paradox and we're always questioning and reaffirming and questioning and reaffirming. 
Uh, I think that's one aspect of it. And then it also goes back to the ultimate purpose. It's right. Like Christian scholars can be incredible because we have nothing to lose. Yeah. Like we can ask big weighty questions and still know at the end of the day, all is secure. Mm-hmm. I think you take those same principles and apply it to coaching. Like we live on a faith built on paradox. We can always just like we're doing right here about quarterfinals question. Hey, like look back in the last year with humility and go, did we do the right things by our athletes? Mm-hmm. Like, did we prepare them adequately, mentally, physically, emotionally, um, and then, and then reaffirm and question, and reaffirm and question, and reaffirm. And yet at the same time, uh, we can also realize that, like you said, Dom, our identity is not wrapped in the success of our athletes or not, which like Sean said in our group message, one of our other coaches, like, Hey, this is a good time to reflect on that. Like, yeah. as we get too caught up in that as coaches, uh, it's like, we can program freely, right? Like sure. we can coach freely. Mm-hmm. Like we can be dangerous coaches knowing that like in the end, like, uh, none of this matters. And that doesn't create like none of this matter. It actually does matter. I shouldn't say it that way. Like um, it has eternal impacts, right? The present does, but our, our end is secure. It's already been bought and paid for. And that frees us here and now. Um, and that creates this beautiful, what seems like a contradiction. If the end is secure, why don't we give a crap now? Mm-hmm. It's like, because we know that what we do now still impacts the end mm-hmm. simultaneously. And we can live in both those worlds. And I think that creates an, I mean, I'm sounds a little braggadocious, but like an unbeatable coach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that I think that's the general realization of our faith as well as because it's rooted in a resurrection. It's like we don't have the viewpoint of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Like, no, there is a massive purpose to what we do right now because of what we know is coming. Mm-hmm. And Ecclesiastes, I th- baby. And yeah. I think that's what, like, I think it's easy to to get on, like, way too far sides of, like, oh, well, none of this matters at all. Only the person matters. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. Like we're supposed to do what we do with excellence. We're supposed to glorify God. We're supposed to be the best workers in our field. Mm -hmm. No one should outshine us as coaches or as athletes and how we approach and do things with detail. And at the same time, someone should be able to come to us and see that like at the end of the day, CrossFit doesn't really mean much in us for us in comparison to Christ Mm -hmm. and what's to come. And I think it's really that one of my favorite pastors I've heard him say, he's like, you have this list of all these things. Christ is not at the top of the list. He's on his own list. And then you have everything else on this list. They're two separate lists. It's Christ on his own and then everything else. And it doesn't mean that these things don't matter. It's just he is the ultimate. And at the end of the day, you'd be willing to lose all of those temporary things if it meant you only had him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where that freedom comes from. And I know that's like for me as a coach, that's where it comes from as well. It's like I can win and lose with my athletes because I know even in the loss, we still have him. Well, and we've, we've been at competi- major competitions. We've seen other coaches like coach from anxiety, right? Like they're as like anxious and, and, and freaked out as their athlete is, which is not going to help the athlete at all. It's like we can, we can coach again with that freedom and that, that, you know, that peace that surpasses understanding that it's like, I get to put my head on the, I get to go home to my wife and my boys tonight and just have fun with my family and yep. put my head on the pillow, rest assured that, God is sovereign, Romans 8, 28, somehow, some way, all the good, all the bad, eternally, he's going to work it out for good. Yeah. And again, that, it, I mean, yeah, I get fired up talking about it. Yeah. It allows us to coach just without ego, right? Yeah. Which as an athlete who wants a coach, you want a coach without an ego, right? Because it means that they can learn from their failures and all they're concerned about is how they can get you to improve. Mm-hmm. They're not concerned with being right, right? Like I'm not concerned with not making a mistake, or coaching out of fear. No, I'm concerned with giving you the absolute best that I can freely knowing that if a mistake happens, it's not going to crush me. It's not going to crush you. We can continue to adapt and move forward and change the game plan. And it's a constant process of improving without who I am being determined by what necessarily is the leaderboard at that moment. Right. Um, Ready for a heart. Can I ask a hard hitter question? Yeah. Yeah. You can't say no. Uh, Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where (laughs) I'm going to go. Yeah. What do you say then to the athletes who may be listening to this to go back to the athletes and go, we're doing coaches too, but athletes specifically. And they're like, well, I don't share that same worldview as you. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in Jesus Christ. Um, How do they, like, what do they root their why in? Like, how do they get that identity rooted in something that's not just going to be taken from them or they lose everything? Yeah. So I don't have an answer to that other than because I'm not sure that there is one outside of uh, what we're talking about. And I I just want to I mean, that's not meant to sound braggadocious by any means or um, superiority complex or anything like that. It's just the truth and it is what it is. What most people, I think, go to 
when they're looking for their why though, that maybe don't share some of this or that we naturally have a tendency to want to uh, default to, right? Is we want to go to our own effort, right? Like that's what a lot of people say. They're like, well, what's your why? Well, my, or why would you be happy? What would make you happy at the end of the weekend, right? If it's not a leaderboard and they'll be like, I just want to give full effort, right? Well, what are they doing in that moment? I don't know if y'all know this or not, but like you're going to fail and <laughs> there are going to be workouts where you're not going to give full effort. And they're going to be, I've talked talk to people about this and I'm like, did you give full effort? And they're like, I don't know. I think I could have gone harder. I think I could have gone faster. And it's like you doubt yourself, right? Because of who you are. And so anyways, I do think that's where if you are, a, if you're an athlete listening to this though, and you don't share that worldview, hear me when I say that that's fine. You still want someone who does share our worldview probably um, only because we are just going to care about you as a person and making you better in a way that people who don't have that worldview can't. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think when you, like Jake is saying, when you do have a coach with that worldview, you're going to have a coach that prioritizes their relationship with you over your leaderboard performance um, because your leaderboard performance isn't going to affect how they feel about how they're viewed in the CrossFit space. Like to be a hundred percent honest, and this might be erring on the side of getting canceled, but I really couldn't care less of what's said about me on the Savon podcast. Mm-hmm. Like Savon is the most useless piece of information for me. Um, and that's, that's actually important for me to live by mm-hmm. and to even like preach to myself because it could be easy for me to get my identity caught up in what the CrossFit world sport world thinks of me. If my athletes don't make it or don't perform the way that they should um, but at the end of the day, the most important thing for me is what is my individual relationship with each one of my athletes? And for me, that is rooted in how I share the gospel with them, live the gospel out to them and love them in a gospel biblical centered way. But it doesn't always just have to be that. And I think one really cool thing about CrossFit specifically, it is like a relation based sport. It's the one sport that I look at where like competitors can actually be friends mm-hmm. and you don't really see that much in other sports. Um, at least not as much, maybe in the off season or in other areas, I think we can like see that or like in an all-star weekend on in the NFL or NBA. But for the majority of this, like we even have athletes that compete against each other, train together on a day-to-day basis. And where else do you really see that? And in some sense, it even bridges that gap of like people who don't even share the same worldview or theology or belief are training together and supporting each other and serving each other. Um, and that family and relationship aspect is something that people often throw way too far to the side because they're so focused on winning or achieving a goal goal that they completely isolate themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think most people really need to look at that and be like, am I utilizing CrossFit to build relationships that could last a lifetime? And if you have our worldview are going to be eternal, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So that's something I always look at and preach to my athletes as well as like, how are you building relationships in this? Or are you just like in your garage alone, grinding, staring at a wall because you want to be the next Matt Frazier? I don't know which is. Yeah. I mean, G- I mean bring, I mean, let's talk about community a little bit, you know, that we were um, Jake talking about on the, on the coaches call, which is, Hey, we're running main performance. Coaching is an individualized coaching program. Like you get assigned to a coach, you work with that coach one-on-one and we're designing your training, your nutrition, your lifestyle broad term again, which encompasses a lot of these conversations. We're talking about your mindset, your recovery, et cetera, your beliefs. Like we're going to have conversations about your why, but to go back to it, it's, it's an individual program. One thing though, that again, when we go back to why are we doing this and what are our beliefs and worldview, I used to teach eighth graders, uh, you know, some middle school, like (laughs) people would be like, what is worldview? Yeah. I would teach them like, it's when you, it's the glasses or the lens that you put on and how you see the world around you. Mm -hmm. And so we see it through a, a Christian theology, right? Like in a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview, uh, to put it simply, uh, where I'm going with this is um, community. Like Jake talked to us about like how we balance individualized training and community at the same time and, 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 and the value of community and just what that, what, what that looks like and how, how we kind of. Yeah. So, those things. I mean, <laughs> the nuts and bolts of it that we do, I mean, Al as coaches is like we program a mayhem compete workout, right. To try to create some of that community, even though it is still online and people are in different places of the world, But like when I talk to my athletes, I'm encouraging them. I'm like, hey, um, you need to not be completely disconnected from your affiliate. Like if you are coming to me for individual programming, I want to make you 
the best I can. But that also means that you need that support structure because I've seen it. Like I have seen athletes do the go to the garage, bang their head against the wall. Right. And, and win. Okay. I've seen them win and guess who they have to share that win with no one. Hmm. Right. It is just them. And I'm like, there are so many people like my gym. I'm like, they want to support you. They want to help you. Like, let them just be in this with you together, right? Even if it means that one of your training sessions isn't absolutely perfect, okay? The end result is going to be so much better, right? Um, so, like, I'm telling my athletes, I'm like, hey, like, you need to rope, like, as many people as you can into doing your stuff, right? <laughs> like, get all of them. Just come on, have a good time, and, like, throw then we'll down sign all of them up. Yeah, for right, and then coach. you can refer them, <laughs> and then we can we can make money from there. Um, but, no. No, yeah. it's, it's never like, uh, if, if I can piggyback and share the story, like with one of my coaching mentors, I'll, uh, I, sh- I shared the story with Jake when we were talking about this and I had, uh, in my gym in Florida, I had a woman who was struggling with some depression and going through a tough season in life. And she came to me and approached me for individual coaching. And I, I remember going to my mentor, like with all of her assessment data and everything and being like, after the consult, like. And here's what I got. Here's my training plan. Like, pick it apart. Give me feedback. What do you think about the program? Here's what I was thinking about nutrition. I'll never forget. He looked at me and he goes, Jake, if you take this woman out of the community class, you could ruin her life. Hmm. And I was like, oh, crap. I was, and he was a believer as well. And he's like, I mean, God designed us for community. It's interwoven into our, our biology. Hmm. And so he was like, you're going to, you can make your depression worse. Hmm. And and, you know, what did that look like for her practically? It was like, hey, you have a mandatory two times. I still yeah. want you in the group class. Right. And uh, and then she did a couple of days with me, and it worked out just fine. But mm-hmm. kind of a practical example or anecdote of what you're – Yeah, and we need to remember that, to. like, with CrossFit athletes, where is the most of their community? Because it is such a relationship-based sport, it's in the gym. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not – that's where they – and so, like, to completely remove them from that, I think – makes people worse in the long run. Like it may make you physically better in the short term. Okay. But I still, even then think that you will not get the longevity and the joy out of it to keep you coming back for more for the long term, Right. If you do that. So, and I think that's why you see most training camp. I don't want to speak cause I can't, I can't think of all of them off the top of my head, but all of them tend to have some type of like group platform now Absolutely. that they're then kind of branching off from. Right. And writing individual programming for or at least trying to include within the, the individual programming that they're doing. Yeah, for sure. Sure. Yeah. One of my favorite pastors again, talks about just like a coal uh, grill when all the coals are together, they're on fire. But if you go take that coal that's on fire and you go put it off in the grass, it's going to lose its flame. Mm-hmm. But then if you go back to it and you grab that coal and you put it back in the fire, it's going to catch flame again. Huh. And that's Good. just the necessity of having that community. And what we as coaches want to provide for you guys is not just a great coach, um, but hopefully a lifelong friend. Mm-hmm. And even even when an athlete stops competing, especially my athletes that I coach in person that I've built like family-like relationships with, I want to be friends with them till I die. Yep. And I don't want really anything to change in that relationship until I die, um, whether they're competing or not or whether I'm coaching or not. I don't really know how long that journey will be for anybody that like I believe is in the Lord's hands, but I do know that I can maintain that friendship. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something I, I focus on creating more than anything with my athletes and have that as the, as the foundation of like, Hey, no matter what happens on the leaderboard, like you're still coming over to my house tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and you'd I be amazed though at how many people don't have that in their life. True. Right. Like regardless of like, just, they don't have that or like they've never experienced it. So. Yeah. Cool. That's a good wrap up point. I think, I think, yeah. So moving in the off season, what would be, I just, I guess just summarize and wrap it up, Jake athletes moving into the off season, very few athletes moving to semifinals. Let's speak to the ones going into their off season, not so much like training wise, but just based on the conversation we had today, what are some of the things that they should be thinking about this upcoming off season before they move into another competition season, whether it's in the fall or next year, what are, what are some of the things that should be on the forefront of their minds? Thinking about in terms of training priorities or thinking no, not about training, training, more not just training. the conversation that we had. Um, I would think one, it would be to, I guess, figure out, um, one, find a coach. Okay. That'd be number one. All right. So plug for us. Um, and then, uh, I guess ask the question of like what you want out of that coach and let them plan that stuff for you because that's their job and that's what they're supposed to do. So we're notoriously bad for trying to like, have you ever tried to program for yourself? 
Uh, <laughs> actually, I've almost always had a coach. Yeah. Yeah. I've, what about you? Yeah. yeah. No, I've always followed something. Yeah. Okay. I've tried to program for myself. It's miserable. It's awful. Don't go that route. Okay. It's terrible. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would just say one, find a coach and then find a coach. Maybe that just aligns with what it is that if it's the stuff that we talked about on this podcast, great. If it's something else, find that, but someone that aligns with your values and your identities and the things that you, if you want somebody who only cares about you winning right. your performance, we, we can give you some numbers. Yeah, we can do that. I don't have their numbers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can point you in the right direction. Yeah. That's cool. Awesome. That's it. Guys. Thanks, Jake. Thanks for being here, man. Uh, kick us off official ending, Dom. That uh, will be the end of the Mayhem Performance <laughs> Podcast quarterfinals review and identity searching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Soul searching. Soul searching. <laughs>